Peter, I think, is uh, one Peter says that. So that's exactly right, Mary. We are foreigners if we are in Jesus Christ because this isn't the world that we're clinging to. The world that we're clinging to is the one to come. Whereas other people, which goes back to what we talked about last night, the difference in Ecclesiastes. And we'll divert for 10 seconds to explain in case you decide to read the book of Ecclesiastes. It's a very short book. It's um, uh, 12 chapters and it's very very confusing when you read it if you don't understand his premise. And his premise is very simple. He gives you life under the sun. Everything under the sun. And he says it's all meaningless. He says it at the beginning, he says it at the end, and he says it throughout the book. And you keep thinking, this guy is some type of narcissist. He's saying, go out and enjoy your life and be merry and enjoy everything that comes to you. But remember that God will hold you to account for it. And you're thinking, you know, the whole thing makes no sense unless you see he's talking about life under the sun and he's equating it, or he's making a contrast to life under the heavens. What our life should be spiritually as opposed to what our life is physically. And if you read the book from that premise, you will have no problem understanding what Solomon is saying to us. And he sums it all up in the 12th chapter. But don't get confused to think that he's waffling in what he's saying. He's not. He's saying God put us here physically to enjoy what he made for us physically, like these fruit over here. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, my mouth is watering just looking at them. That's why he gave us these things. Enjoy them, but understand that we will be held account for everything that happens to us and everything we do under the life in the sun because there is a life under the heavens that we should be looking forward to. Okay, having said that, what Mary said is right. We are pilgrims here looking forward to life under the heavens. So we are... But we're not living in the future. This is That's right. While we're here on earth. That's right. And in that sense, we're dual citizens. We're dual citizens in the sense that we are here. We're constrained by this. Everything that happens to other people will happen to us. Right. And we're to enjoy it and use it, but not to make it our only hope. It's to be something that we use until we leave here. This is not our real home. There's Christians, I think, who believe that they can kind of live their life in a bubble here because everything is out there. That's right. It's all in the future, and that is not. Have you heard the sermon? I've heard a million sermons say the same thing, and I'll, I'll use it someday. Some people are so heavenly minded that they're... No you have no earthly good. It's a wonderful sentence. It really confirms what some people are doing. They're saying, oh, I don't need to worry about this. But we do. We are here and God put us here. Not only to live here and to enjoy it, but also to tell other people about what is coming. And one of the things I'm hearing a lot lately is, well, I'm, I'm waiting for the rapture. I, I want Christ to come, so I don't want to deal with all this stuff going on around me. Yeah, that's, that's right. the way God wants us to live. That's right. Fight, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's right. So... We're, we're fighting, and at the same time, we're anticipating without losing sight of the fact that we are here. It, it's, it really is a double-edged sword in that case, but didn't mean to divert so far, but I wanted to get that point out of verse number one. Is it, they were strangers. There was no contradiction in the Bible, and likewise what Mary said, we are also strangers or sojourners here. And Abraham dwelt in the land. Isaac dwelt in the land. They had sheep. They had servants. They had everything here. They weren't waiting for... The rapture, they were living their lives and they were raising their children in the admonition of the Lord. So that's exactly the way it is. And then in verse 2, you've already read this, it says, this is the history of Jacob, Joseph being 17. It's like, what? This is the history of Jacob, but then it introduces Joseph. And so you think that there's a problem here, but as we've talked about in the past, God is starting out with the general and uh, then getting specific, and then he branches back out, and then he gets specific, and it goes this way all the way through the Bible, leading to the Messiah. Now, Joseph is not the tribe, either of his sons, Manasseh or Ephraim, that point to the Messiah. But we're going to branch over to Joseph for a reason, and we're going to talk about it all the way through here. So, But Jacob is the one, and eventually Judah will be the one then the Davidic line will be, but we're, we're doing this, we're narrowing down, but all of these side stories have a purpose. As that one paragraph I analyzed yesterday in, in uh, which, I, I, oh, we talked about that in this class last week. The poor Saturday class is going to already have all that information because it's only one paragraph, but it's a fun paragraph, isn't it? You know, Rachel goes down 
to Bethlehem on the way she dies. And all of that points to Jesus. And that's what all of this does. So, but didn't mean to cheat the Saturday class. They're way behind us. They're, if, if you, you who attend the Saturday class know they're way behind. Uh, we're back in chapter 15. Okay, so please go ahead. Chapter, uh, verse 2. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made a richly ornamented robe. So you can see favoritism all over that. You know, there's nothing wrong with loving one child more than another. My mom loves our middle brother the most, and so all it's done is cause bitterness and consternation in our family. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> he, my middle brother, when we were younger, was just more tender than the rest of us. And here, here's an example. I have one dog that is chronically sick, and so all the other dogs have to be put on the side as far as attention. That's just the way it is. That doesn't mean we're showing favoritism to this thing. It's just that that's the way it has to be. And that's the way my middle brother was. He's just, he was skinny and he was quiet and you know, all of these things. And now he's, Ethan, he's, the, he's bigger than the rest of us. He's more handsome than the rest of us. He's smarter than the rest of us. But when he was young, it was kind of the flip side. He was very quiet in school. And so, you know me, I've always been the way I am. And my oldest brother was bigger than us and would pound on us. So. You know, if I got pounded on, I'd just run away, whereas Ethan would, he would do whatever mom would have to protect. So anyway, but this is not the same thing. This is real favoritism here. And so it is going to cause, as you know, a lot of consternation between them. And it mentions back up in verse 2 that um, he was with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. And we could go back and see who they were, but it does not mention the sons of Leah. Okay, so who are Leah? That would be uh, Judah, uh, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, and then there's one more later. She had, I think, no, six sons. But you have, what's that? Issachar, maybe. That's right. So anyway, um, but for whatever reason, it only mentions the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah. Okay, maybe because I'm the son of Rachel. You know what I'm saying? And because I'm the son of Rachel, and you guys are just the sons of the maidservants, and he brought him a bad report, like these half-sons of yours are. I don't know what the reason is, but I'm just trying to get us to think that through. Go ahead, next verse. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field, when suddenly my sheep rose and stood upright, while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed down to it. His brother said to him, Do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. Okay, so he has a dream that he is the center of everything and all the sheaves are bowing to his sheaf, okay? I saw a movie. I think it was one of those ones that was on TV and it was so well done. I mean, the sheaves, oh, it's, the, the symbolism was fantastic. Now, obviously, this is Joseph. and We know it is because he goes down to the court and he eventually becomes number two in the land of Egypt, only to Pharaoh. But this is pointing to Jesus. It's just a type in a picture of Jesus. This, the ultimate fulfillment was not in Joseph. Jesus is the tribe of Judah, and the 12 tribes of Israel bow to him. Okay, so I just want to make sure that we don't get lost in the immediate for what the Bible is trying to tell us, is that there is a greater fulfillment in the person of Jesus. Now, while we're at, oh, we're going to wait, and we'll finish down to verse 9, and then we'll talk about something else. Go ahead brothers said to him, oh, wait, do that. Okay. Then he had another dream, and he told it to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. Go ahead and read 10, too, because it's in the same. He told his father as well as his brothers. His father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? Okay, I'll go ahead, finish. His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Okay, kept the matter in mind, 
Does anybody remember anybody else who kept the matter in mind? Mary. Good job. Oh, very good. Oh, she pondered all these things in her heart. Absolutely. Okay, so um, we have another dream. So he's either a lunatic or he's having dreams from God. And uh, <laughs> kidding. Anyway, so he uh, uh, has this dream, the sun and the moon and the stars. Or the sun and the moon and the what? It does it say where was that? Um, yeah, the sun, the moon, and the 11 stars bowed down to me. Okay. Did that happen to Joseph? Not, not, not entirely. Mother. That's right. The, the mother wasn't there. When they were down there, and the father didn't bow down to him. He just came down to be with his son. So although the father thinks this must be pertaining to my son and it's me, the father was saved by him, brought down there, but his father didn't bow to him in any shape or form. In fact, I think it's the opposite is what we're going to come to. But we do know that it was fulfilled in the person of Jesus. So once again, we have something with a greater fulfillment in Jesus. And then a very similar account, which we're doing in the Sunday class right now. If you're not in the Sunday class, we just went through this a couple weeks ago, is Revelation chapter 12. Now a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and on her head a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. And another sign, um, a, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten hordes and seven diamonds, uh, diadems on his head. And um, anyway, it talks about these, uh, it, it goes down a little farther, but it, it, it's kind of this apocalyptic vision that John is having. Well, it's the same context as what we're talking about here. The question is, in Revelation 12, it says that the a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a, uh, had a, a garland of 12 stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And then it says here in verse, verse 5, she bore a male child who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and his throne. If you are the Catholic Church, you believe that that is you, and that Jesus is the fulfillment of that. It's the male child, but they believe that they are the mother of the 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 uh, uh, this in this vision. I've read that somewhere. I don't remember where, so I don't want to be like that's total church doctrine if it's just people in the church that believe that. I don't know which. But that is not speaking of the Catholic Church and it is not speaking of Christianity. It's speaking of what? Who is the mother? Israel. Because the child was born not from the church. The child was born from Israel and the church was born from his life and death and crucifixion and resurrection. We came about after, not before. So in the book of Revelation, it is certainly speaking of Israel. But people turn things around because they want their theology to fit whatever they believe. As I've said in the past, some people say that uh, uh, they are the lost ten tribes of Israel. Have any of you ever heard that? Uh, some denominations claim that we are the lost ten tribes of Israel. Or some Jewish people say, we know we're the lost ten tribes of Israel. Or some of them are in India. Some of them are in Afghanistan. And they go to all these convoluted reasons as to why that's case. When in, when in fact there are no lost tribes of Israel at all. None. How do we know that? Does anybody know how we know that there are no lost tribes of Israel? Because after the exile of the ten tribes, after the exile of the ten tribes, which are considered the lost, and everybody goes back to that point, ten of the twelve tribes are specifically mentioned within the Bible, okay, by name of people coming down to Jerusalem to worship. And in the New Testament, even then, many of them are mentioned. Simeon, Asher, um, uh, what is her name? Uh, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. What's his name? Um, uh, Paul is of the tribe of Benjamin. These different people are from these different tribes. And three times, I believe it is, in the New Testament, Paul says it twice. Paul says it once, twice. Jane says it once, and I think Peter says it once. To the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. They knew who they were. And Paul, standing up in the court while he was under interrogation, while he was imprisoned, he said, this is the hope that our 12 tribes are presently waiting for. So he confirms there are no lost 10 tribes of Israel. Okay, so let the Bible interpret the Bible. And I don't mean to divert once again, but this is all pointing right back to this account right here. God had promised in the Old Testament to save a faithful remnant of all the tribes of Israel. 
And he has. He knows who they are. He knows now that they're back in the land, which belong to which tribe. So there is a faithful remnant of the... Now, we don't know who the tribes are, and why is that? Why do we know, not know who belongs to what tribe? The records were destroyed uh, after the... Um... At the destruction of the temple. 